Hey everyone, it's Pacific, and welcome back to another episode of SCP Archives. Just as a quick reminder, for Season 4, we are telling a story week to week over the course of 12 episodes, and while you can jump in at this episode, for the best listening experience, we suggest you go back and start with Serapis Part 1, 2021, and then work your way up to us here. Second, just a reminder, I'm making a true crime podcast. Addison Peacock and Nicole Goodnight, both of which who you know from this show, uh, are helping me make it, and it's really cool. This week, as of uh, March 28th, we're releasing an episode about Annabelle. We've also covered things like the Conjuring series, movies 1, 2, and 3, Chucky the Doll, and even Hannibal Lecter. And we have a ton of cool stories coming up. But it would mean the world to us if you gave it a listen. And if you liked it, give it a review or tell a friend about it. You can find our podcast, Insidious Inspirations, wherever you listen to podcasts, or by going to www.insidious.show. And without further ado, this week's episode. Warning. The Foundation database is classified. Unauthorized access will result in detainment. Within this archive, you'll find the procedures, descriptions, and accounts of the most notorious anomalies we've encountered to date. Secure. Contain. Protect. This is Agent Hector Gallio. The following information is classified Level 5 under Project Serapis. O5 eyes only. Researching the history of Shibbets Vale in southern Montana goes beyond police reports and local government archives. I sought out information from Foundation assets embedded in academia, particularly among anthropology and psychology faculties. My assets returned with unpublished manuscripts and notes. The manuscript was left to the University of Michigan History faculty by Professor Walter Shepard upon his death in 1969. Professor Shepard was an anthropologist and conducted an extensive project gathering oral histories from indigenous peoples, particularly Americans of the Northwest United States. Among his notes were the transcripts of interviews he had conducted on the Crow Nation Reservation in Montana, close to the Morning Cloak Mountains in Shibbets Vale. These transcripts covered many areas of Crow history and culture and life on the reservation at the time. Professor Shepard's notes indicate that he wanted to archive this information because much of it was passed on by oral tradition and was in danger of being forgotten or corrupted by time. Accordingly, he recorded his interviews and later transcribed them. The purpose of this specific interview was to learn about strange illness that seemed to affect settlers in the Yellowstone area, but notably did not affect the Crow Nation. The interviewee was John Medicine Weasel, then 44 years of age, a full-blood member of the Crow Nation and grandson of a Crow brave named Broken Nose who fought in the Great Sioux War of the 1870s. My research independently verified that John Medicine Weasel died on the Crow Reservation in 1961. I'm going to record this. Is that okay? What are you going to use this for? Are you just trying to make me famous? It's just for personal use so that I can go back and listen to this conversation if needed. Mm. All right, then. Go ahead. Thanks. So, just for the tape, tell me your name and who you are. Again? Name's John Medicine Weasel. Told you once already. I live here on the reservation, working mostly construction. Both my parents were crow. Last time we spoke, you mentioned your grandfather. I understand his name was Broken Nose? Mm, yeah, that's right. He went to the other side camp uh, around 1913, I believe. Did you know him well? No, not really. We didn't spend much time with him. He only stayed with us near the end. He had an idea that I should learn some of what he'd learned as a young man coming up. I suppose I was around 14, you know, about to be a man, that kind of thing. And he knew it was getting closer to his time, you know, time to go to the other side camp. One day he called me up to his room, and he'd always been this big and tough guy most of his life, but now he's all skin and bones. He smelled like a hospital. He smelled of ointment and disinfectant, had an oxygen cylinder by the bed that hissed. He said he had a lesson and a story, but the lesson was quicker. What was it? He said, set on near natural sources of red ochre. He believed red ochre would help protect 
against some forms of sickness and against certain spirits and forms of medicine. And that's interesting. Mm, well, yeah, same thing. He taught my father, but not that dad would have followed his advice. Then Grandpa managed to lean up off his bed, and he was near the end then, and he said, John, I'd always believe that, and I'll believe it after I'm gone. There's something else you need to know. In all my life, I've only ever met one truly evil spirit, only ever seen one truly bad piece of medicine, the people of the bone tree. I'm not familiar with them. Yeah, most people aren't. They still aren't. Even my grandpa's people didn't believe. He didn't even believe his own stories about the bone tree people. Grandpa didn't say anything about where they're from, but it always sounded like there were some outlaws who came across the country with the settlers. They weren't from our side. And I don't just mean the crow side, but the side of anyone in the valley, even other tribes or the settlers themselves. He said the bone people are named after that fruit from that forest it grew in. But nobody really knows much about it, and as far as I know, as far as I can tell, they aren't around anymore. I see. Can you tell me more about the bone tree people? <laughs> For $10, I'll tell you the whole thing. My grandpa, he was a rough one when he was young, and I didn't really realize it at the time, but I took after him more than I knew. Even I was a warrior from a young age, or at least I thought I was, kind of back then. That age, we all think we're tough. That's before the real world gets to us, though. Grandpa was a real crow warrior. He was young when this happened. A man, yeah, but he hadn't been for long, and he still had a lot to prove. I always knew him as just Grandpa, but back then people knew him as a broken nose. What did you say this was? Well, there was this big war between the government on one side and the Sioux and Cheyenne on the other. You know, the one the one where Yellowhair met his ultimate demise. A real turning point in American history. One of the last real big Indian wars, you know. This would be the Great Sioux War in 1876? Well, sure, yeah. That's what the whites called it, 76 or 77. The Crow sided with the government back then. It was uh, because the Sioux and Cheyenne had always been enemies with the Crow. I mean, there were times of peace, times of allyship, lots of stories about good times. Spotted Cloud was a Crow chief during that time, and he wanted to work with the white government to help the Crows keep their lands. And a lot of folks opposed him, went against him. I guess that was the time, but we're small and beautiful, an important piece of our land, even if they made it into a reservation, so I guess he kind of had a point. Broken Nose, your grandfather, he knew Spotted Cloud? Sure did. The man was a leader even back then. He was still relatively young when he became a chief. At the time Grandpa was talking about... A lot of the warriors were off scouting and fighting for the government in the war, and there weren't so many left back in the villages. They moved the villages around a lot, too, you know, following the buffalo, um, trapping fur for trading, so they always kept moving. At that time, being nomadic was a choice, but they had to keep moving. That season, they were in a real pretty valley not far from here, actually. They say it's a place where the sun is always shining. Grandpa says he used to go there and see it when he was still healthy, just to remember. And as it had happened, there was lots of red ochre in the area. I'm sorry I knew of the bone tree people because they always made trouble. They'd come down from the forest, past their territory, and steal supplies from nearby tribes and towns. One time the bone tree people, they tried to steal a horse from us once. Didn't end well for them. One got shot in the gut and captured, and all the rest fled, they left him. Grandpa saw them steal some horses from some white people a few times, but never saw them ride the horses, which is a bit curious. They never stayed for long, and they rarely came down, so us crows didn't worry about them until we saw them approaching. The Bone Tree people were in Shibbets Vale? Hmm, right near Lake Apasawa, yeah, but up the mountain deep in the woods. But this time, 
my grandpa told me about they didn't just come for horses. It was just before sunset, and a soul bone tree came out of the woods, and they had come for a child. Oh, my God. Now, I know you get this picture of all Indians riding into town and carrying people off, these noble savages. It's a romantic thing to think about, but folks got raided, and they got raided in return. Of course, not the crew. Well, not very much. They they really just minded their own business unless they're provoked. And it was usually horses or cattle, and not people. It just didn't happen like that in those days. It was a quiet day, and some were out hunting, and others were just tending to camp. Kids usually have independence in camp, you know. Around adults, they just trust them to be safe and smart. They let them go wherever they want and, and experience and learn. So some kids were, they were out near an edge, edge of the camp, playing in the woods. And as uh, the sun begins to go down, the kids come back usually. Well, people noticed pretty quickly that one of the kids didn't come back with the others. And a few of the parents started looking around camp and making sure he didn't come back early or something, but they couldn't find him. So Grandpa goes out to where the kids are playing, but even he doesn't see that missing kid anywhere. And then a few other men and women in camp join him, looking around. And that's when one of the women noticed a figure, that soul-bone tree in the distance, fading away from camp back towards the forest. The men, by then, they'd been ready to ride, and this blood cloud, he, he held them back, and he said no. I guess that says a lot about the man and how much they respected him. He said they needed a plan. They had to do this properly. The missing child was Grandpa's sister's boy, but I never knew her. Grandpa told me he felt it was his responsibility that he was supposed to protect her because he was the big brother. And at that time, Grandpa was one of the Red Otters. Their secret society, a band of warriors, you had to be invited just to join. They're led by this old timer named uh, Old Fire, and he was a tough bastard. Even Grandpa looked up to him. Old Fire dragged Grandpa to his feet and said, Broken nose, don't you dare mourn for your sister's boy when he's not yet dead. We're going to get him back. Don't insult Little Rabbit like that. Little Rabbit was his name, and we didn't speak the name of the dead. It's not our way. Calls him back. But that meant that Old Fire was promising he was alive that they were going to get him back. So Grandpa says, what are we going to do? I haven't heard this story from anyone else. What, you think it didn't happen because it's not written down or something? No, no, I mean, it's strange that an event this unusual didn't enter the common recollection of the crow. News would have spread, especially if Spotted Cloud was involved. Well, yeah, there's a reason it didn't spread. Few reasons, actually. I think I mentioned one of the bone tree people got shot in the gut trying to steal a horse, right? Most they said to kill him, but Spotted Cloud, he said no. And at that time, there was enough respect for him even to stay their hands. And they kept him away from everyone else, always tied up like a dog. They respected him. Well, dogs, they're sacred to the crows. You even respect your enemies. They kept him fed and treated him better than most would have wanted, but Spotted Claus said nobody knows anything about these bone tree people, and here we have a fellow who could tell us. Come to find out, the morning after Little Rabbit was taken, Spotted Cloud takes some of the men over to where the bone tree is kept, and he says to him, you know you got enough of our tongue by now to understand me, so now's the time to show us we were right to keep you alive. You, you lead us to where your people are in the forest, then... If you do well, we'll cut you loose. I just don't know what they said they'd do to the fellow if he said no, but it must have been pretty bad because they came back to the village with this man following them and they had a rope around his neck and his hands were still tied. I know settlers were pale, but Grandpa said his skin was like mud, gray, stink. His back and arms were covered in scabs and sores, all pussy. He had no hair on his head or body, but he looked like a man with a strange disease. But he had always been like that. It never seemed like he got any better or any worse. 
Spotted Claus said the Red Otters would be the ones to go get the child back. They would take the prisoner to the forest, find the Bone Tree people, and fight if they had to. So they got all their supplies, everything they needed, and agreed that Old Fire would lead Grandpa and one other man comes with the stars. They would take two horses each in case one got killed. The crows, we've always had a lot of stories about horses. And I think it was why the scene shine were always so jealous. Just the three of them? That's all they thought they would need. And did they know the enemy numbers? No one could be sure. The most they'd ever seen was half a dozen or so. Because outlaws, they're like mice. Where there's one, there's more. Inside the forest, there could be any number of them, really. And I don't think the government, they really even knew that they existed or cared. Which, if they were outlaws, probably suited them quite all right. This would explain why this is the first I've heard of them. Oh, uh, yeah. They're all gone now, so it doesn't matter. But Spotted Cloud, he wanted to stay on good terms with the government, and he knew that involved keeping them from learning about the bone tree. Bone trees are like a dirty secret. They didn't follow government orders, and no one in our tribe wanted to start issues with some crazy white folk hiding in the woods. And when they did come to the valley, they always gave our camp a wide berth. What do you think that was? I don't think. I know. It's because we kicked their ass a few times they come to the valley. But Grandpa says it's because of where our village sat. The earth beneath our village was rich with red ochre. And our power comes from the land itself. It's the land that protects us and provides for us, watches over us. Why was red ochre important? Now you know what it is, right? Soil rich with iron, red as blood. People have always used it to paint, to dye their clothes, or even sometimes make medicine for protection or even love. It's supposed to be antibacterial, too. So before they left, broken nose comes with the stars and old fire. They used red ochre to stain their skin and dye their clothes. And if all the bone tree people were sick, this would keep them from getting the bone tree infection. And did old fire have a plan for when they arrived? Yeah, ride in, grab the child, kill anyone who got in our way. He wasn't a man to overcomplicate things. <laughs> so he gathered the red otters at the edge of the village with their pet bone tree on a spare horse and his hands tied. And he said broken nose could lead the way. Could he have refused it? I suppose he could have. I guess so, maybe. But I don't think it occurred to him that he could. It was his family in there, and... No more war deeds, more honors, to better himself as a warrior, his social standing. So they rode to Shibba's Vale, but it wasn't night yet, but the trees were black, like black ash from a fresh fire. The captive bone tree, he wouldn't do anything until old fire showed him a knife he carried, notches down his blade so they'd hook into a man's guts and pull him out when he stabbed him. I'm not sure if he ever used it, but he had that look that tells you that he had. He didn't recognize the bone tree language. It had some words from the tongues of the settlers in those parts, but all jumbled up and distorted weird-like. He made some actions that made it clear enough what he was going to do if the prisoner didn't lead them right. And I couldn't really get if this bone tree was really scared or if he was going to lead them to his people anyway. Grandpa didn't know, and he says old fire wasn't sure either. This guy had a face that you couldn't read. It's like a stone. Grandpa said it was all scarred, all weird, and his veins had turned hard and dark and blistered up from his skin, like fat on a fire. He took them into the forest, and the red otters had trouble staying together. They had to call out so they didn't get separated in the trees. They lost some of the spare horses on the way, and it slowed them down a lot. Then, comes with the stars, calls out to dismount and get low. He'd seen an outlaw's camp up ahead, near the mouth of a cave. They tied off the horses and tied the bone tree prisoner to a tree trunk while they're at it. Then they moved forward, all quiet, and as quiet as they could go. Grandpa knew better than to hope that they would take the bone trees by surprise with all this noise they'd made getting there. Did your grandfather know the exact location? Any landmarks? Why? So you can dig it up and go get published? Oh, such luck. That forest was far from our home. And unfamiliar, but that wasn't the only problem. 
when they got to the forest, it was like it didn't want anyone knowing their way around. Without their prisoner, they might be still riding in circles. Soon, Red Otters got close enough to see a clearing that had been cut in the forest, and there were wood cabins in a cluster. It looked like they'd been there for a long time and were falling apart, all covered in moss and full of holes. Abandoned outpost, maybe. Overrun by the outlaws. Grandpa, he figured as much. Red otters didn't see anybody, but the embers were still hot, so the bone tree were near. But he didn't have time to look around. And they heard a gunshot ring out. Someone yells out so everyone would know they're under attack, and then it's just chaos. Old fire motions for comes with the stars and Grandpa to keep to the woods and get into a better position. As they're running through the woods, they catch a glimpse of the bone tree people. They're like the prisoner, skin gray like new ash, all diseased and pocked. Diseased? Again? They were all sick, or that's how Grandpa put it anyways. I think it was more than just diseased, but I guess there wasn't any other way to say it, dude. Just bad medicine. And one bone tree runs right out, comes with the stars. But as soon as they made contact, the bone tree jumped back and started shrieking. He'd gotten some of Grandpa's red ochre dye on him, and it seemed like it was just scorching his skin, making all the diseased flesh bubble and pop, like throwing water on hot rocks. That's when Grandpa sees the bone tree's mouth is like an eel's, too long on his face and wide as his shoulders, like a water monster. It opens wide, full of teeth, and then bites down and comes with the stars, taking a big, bloody chunk out of him. And that's when Grandpa knew this wasn't just some strange white man, but something, nothing, like whoever it used to be. He had his knife and his bow, but it was too close for the bow, so he lunged at the bone tree, and with his knife, he hit him right in the side where it's soft. Grandpa heard a lot of men hurt and killed, a lot of men dying, but he told me he never in his life heard the noise the bone tree made when he struck him. He told you that? Yeah. He got this real far away look in his eyes, like he could hear it in the distance. I always heard how he's a strong guy, a real old warrior, an old timer, you know. But not then, lying in bed, so skinny you'd think he's starved, his bones popping through his clothes. His eyes were welling up while he talked about killing that bone tree. Must have been a wrench to let himself look that weak. I was the only person in the room, and he wouldn't let anyone else in while he told it all. And that stuck with me as much as the story. How small and frail he looked. And how he only wanted me to see it. You don't show when you're upset. It's not our way. Not if you want to stay proud. I guess he knew he wasn't for this world much longer. He knew it was his time. So he wouldn't have to try to hold his head up around me, knowing I'd seen him like that. He'd gone through so much, this old man. He'd seen the tale of the Plains Wars and watched tribes being whittled down, beat down, subjugated. He'd seen the reservation turn into what it is now, a place of confusion. Seen the government try to educate the Indian out of us. I saw he'd come through that as much broken as he was proud. And I think a lot about it. I'm proud of who I am, and I never died in any of our history, good or bad. But thinking back to that old timer, I see how much pain there is for us just being alive, thinking about what we lost. Hey everyone, Pacific here with a quick ad break and a reminder. You can find ad-free versions of all of our episodes at patreon.com slash scp underscore pod. And now, back to the show. Your grandfather had just fought the bone tree. Yeah, sorry. I got sidetracked. <clears throat> Don't apologize, John. All the bone tree are like the one Grandpa killed. Something's always wrong with them. Once he saw one slithering along on the ground, and in place of legs he had dark roots like a dozen snakes, all caught in a den writhing through the dirt. Another is big, real huge, but all flabby. What Grandpa sees it's not fat, it's those white fruit growing all over his body, and he has a club made out of a jawbone. Guy is literally the size of a grizzly bear. 
and Grandpa knows that he can't back down with Little Rabbit counting on him so much. So he stands his ground, and this big bone tree crashes right into him. They wrestled down around on the ground, and Grandpa remembered how the guy's skin was soft like clay and came off in big handfuls. The big guy's roaring and thrashing, and Grandpa gets his knife clear enough to stab down into his neck, like stabbing into deep black mud. Because of that, he gets this juice of these weird fruit all over him. He says he hears voices then, far away, and a woman's voice. It was kind of hard to make out what he meant when he told me about this part. He said he saw a woman running away from something chasing her across the valleys and forests, across mountains. She crosses the frozen ocean until it comes a new, empty place where she can lay down and rest. He said it wasn't like the type of vision you get from fasting out on a mountain in the elements. He said it was more of like an old memory that's just coming back to you after a long time, like you know it, like a friend. Then he feels the weight being hauled off him. Comes with the stars is dancing around a big bone tree, trying to exhaust him, and old fires pulling my grandpa back to his feet. There's blood all over him, so much he has to wipe it out of his eyes. And that's when they hear a little rabbit. He's in the cave calling out for them. He was still alive? Yeah. Grandpa starts towards the cave, and that's when he notices it's not a cave. It's more like a tunnel made of trees. The branches and trunks had all grown together to meet overhead. It was pitch dark, so they lit some branches from the ember and the firelights to light the way. Bunches of those fruits, they hung all over. This is a tunnel made out of the living trees? The bone tree people had trained them to grow like that? Grandpa didn't say he wasn't thinking like you might, Professor. Especially when they found the horses. Were these the horses they'd stolen from the valley? Those and maybe some of the ones they'd first arrived with. But they hadn't kept them to ride. Not even to eat. They were wrapped up in the walls by the branches and roots. Most of them were skeletons. Some still had flesh on them hanging. They just rotted where they hung. Grandpa remembers the stink of them, like buffalo piled up. The bottom of a buffalo jump. The freshest had their bellies torn open. They were hollowed out like something had pulled out their guts. And the skin it was all stretched and they were covered in the same dark veins as the bone tree people. They'd done that to the horses? That's what Grandpa said. Don't know why. Don't even know what. So the crow pressed down down those tunnels and they split. Old fire and comes with the stars went one way and Grandpa went the other by himself. By then, Grandpa heard Little Rabbit shouting again. The boy must have heard fighting and he was screaming and hollering in a fit to bring the place down. So Grandpa sprinted right at the sound. Up ahead, there were a few bone tree people and they just slammed into one another and he couldn't see anything, just stabbing blindly in the dark, stabbing and pulling and stabbing and pulling his knife back when he felt he'd hit something. That must have been the last bone tree because after that, the cave was silent. Grandpa grabbed Little Rabbit and called for old fire and they rode home. Now, as far as I know, that was the last they ever saw of the bone tree people. Presumably because they'd wiped out the whole group in the caves. Upsalaga didn't have any reason to go back towards that area. And most whites avoided it for how treacherous and dark the forest seemed. Did they take their bone tree prisoner back with them? Grandpa left him tied to the tree. His people could have him. I guess if there were any left, Rolfire wasn't going to kill a prisoner tied up in defenses. But he wasn't going to bring any one of those people back among the crow either. So when they're past the bounds of the forest, old fire draws him to a halt and he says that he has to go back and do something that had to be done. He asks Grandpa and comes with the stars to wait at the edge of the woods for him to return. Just before dawn, old fire came back and they were silent. Grandpa remembers that as much as the battle. We would tell of what we did in the war. We named our coups and our victories. It's like a story we all made, the story of, of our lives, accomplishments, those war deeds. But those men, they didn't call out their deeds from that day. They just rode back to the village. Grandpa never asked Old Fire what he had done because he knew full well what it was. And he never spoke it aloud either. Not even Spotted Cloud demanded to know. 
Little Rabbit was back and the bone tree were beaten. Everything else, they would leave buried. What do you think Old Fire did? The same thing you think they did. And I ain't gonna say it either. I see. What happened to the rest of the bone tree? I don't know. Maybe they went elsewhere. And the ones that were left, there couldn't have been many. None there now, not that many crow go over that way anymore to look anyways. One other question's been bothering me. There are plenty, of course, where they came from, how they ended up that way. But what I really wonder is, what do they need the child for? You know, I thought about that too. They must have known the crow would come after them and come ready to kill. If they'd actually wanted the crow to wipe them out, they couldn't have done much better than what they already did. They could have needed medicine, like, really needed it to survive. It's the only thing that explains that kind of risk. Grandpa said he didn't know, and I don't know either. And there ain't any of them around to ask. You might not know, but you must have made some guesses. Maybe they were holding him for ransom, hoping that we'd give them food and medicine if they returned our boy. Maybe. They wanted back the one that we shot, tied up. I can't really say. The region around Shibbets Vale and Lake Apasawa has yielded many examples of Native American archaeology. Most of it is from the Crow who lived in the area for centuries, with a significant contribution from the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Shoshone. But some of it appears unrelated to examples from the Great Plains tribes. I've sought out examples of these anomalous artifacts from Foundation assets in academia, but no originals have been located. A few sketches and descriptions still exist of carved stone tablets with pictograms describing the journey of a divine being, or ancestor figure from land to the east, who reaches a new home and slumbers. Symbology suggests this being is associated with fertility, growth, and the forest. Together with John Medicine Weasel's testimony, this begins to build up a picture of what the Crow knew as the Bone Tree People. By the time logging was established in Shibbets Vale in the 1930s, any sign of them was gone. The fact that they used wooden cabins and were unrelated to any of the Native American tribes nearby suggests they were originally European settlers. They may have established themselves there to trap fur in the Morning Cloak Mountains. It's impossible to say for sure, except that they must have come from somewhere. And in the end, they definitely settled in the wrong place. The story of the Bone Tree people confirms an anomalous history of Shibbets Vale stretching back at least to the late 19th century. I've been unable to find stories or documentation predating this account, leading me to believe that this anomaly may have been introduced to the area by colonists looking to settle the region. I'm closing in on the true nature of Shibbets Vale and the entity associated with anomalies there. A figure fleeing westwards, finding shelter at the foot of the morning cloaks and sleeping to recover from its flight a deity associated with life and growth and their aberrations, corrupted flora and fauna, hallucinogenic plant life. All these are recurring elements of the region's history. The picture is becoming more complete. All recovered information has been collected under Project Serapis. This information is classified level 5, O5 eyes only. Agent Hector Gallio signing... Agent Gallio? That's me. This office is level 5 access only. What's this about? I am here representing the O5 Council. <laughs> I have higher clearance than you, Agent. Mm. Be assured, I have every right and reason to be here. Then what do you want? The Council has noted the excellent quality of your work on Project Seraphis. Your research and collation of this intelligence has been exemplary and of great use to the Council. Let me guess. I'm off the case. The Council has deemed Project Serapis no longer an effective use of Foundation resources. You are requested to hand over all materials pertaining to this project and await future assignment. I was just getting somewhere. It's more than just another monster hunt. SCP is something else. I've almost worked out what... We sent the MTF in way too early. We can't fight this thing with bullets and bad language. It's way beyond that. The Council is well aware 
and the conclusions you have drawn so far about the history of Shibit Vale. The information you have collected for them is more than enough for their current purposes. Any further research is without value. You are reminded that as of this moment, you no longer have the clearance necessary to access Project Serapis. If there is any delay in your compliance, security will have to be summoned. So that's it. As you say, Agent Galio, that is it. Surrender your personal effects and submit to a body scan at the security post before you leave the building. You're, they're throwing this away! I'm so close. Thank you, Agent Galio. We'll take it from here. This week's episode is possible thanks to our patrons. Joining us this week was Damien Harris, Spam Man, Lakota M. Gilseppi, Shadow of Blaze, Blue Jacks, No Salinas, Daedalus Sings, Bry Catman, Spike Milligan, and Sarah C. Thanks, guys. Your support means the world, and you help us do what we do. Project Serapis was written by Ben Counter. Gallio was John Grills. Shepard was Graham Rowett. John Medicine Weasel was Ben Pease. O5 Rep was Dana Creaseman. Our Crow Tribe Consultant was Nina Sanders. Our Line Editor was Daisy McNamara. Our Sound Designer was Dana Creaseman. And all of our music was done by the incredible Tom Rory Parsons. I'm your showrunner, Pacific S. Obadiah, and our producers are Tom Owen and Brad Miska. And this is a bloody disgusting show. For more information, visit scparchives.com. <laughs>